the other week I was training and we're just practicing takedowns. I yeah. put the video on the Insta and uh, my ankle, you could hear the ripping in the ankle. Mm, really. So I'm not like hobbling around anymore, which yeah. is great. But yeah, it wasn't ideal. Um, I think it's going to, it said about six to eight weeks. Yeah, okay. um, so probably next week, strap it right up and I'll be all right back on the mats maybe, but say a couple of weeks after. But yeah, it wasn't great. Yeah, ankles are shit, they? Fucking Owen Jones. Like, the, what do you heel hook me or something? Yeah. And it's just fucking. It's Call him first cow, didn't he? Yeah, fucking something. <laughs> but he just fucking. He didn't even put it on, bless him. He just fucking. He's just technique so good. It's on, like. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not ideal. Like, the. Um, the, the injury. And, like, you, you, you know, you know jiu jitsu. You can just get injured inconspicuously oh, and that's all it was Most a couple of weeks ago people get injured in the most stupid ways don't they and it's, and it's hard it's, it's very rarely is it sparring it's when you're sort of like going 50-50 yeah. like just chilled and that's yeah. when you, you find stuff happens because it's you're loose you, know, you always say that to me didn't you when I first started he, he was like don't go too easy like I went for a stage of like I don't know being really flowy and whatever but I was finding like I was like getting a niggle and he was like yeah you can't if someone's pretty new or like don't know what they're doing he was like you can't give them too much because they'll just crank shit or they'll push it no 100% and I got, yeah. I got a couple 100%. of fucking niggles from that yeah one of the worst injuries I had it was uh, I've got a bit of a, an elbow problem at the moment it was actually the other elbow but I was um, I think I was up in the Lake District right um, it's the Lake or the Peaks it was a Chesterfield way, whichever one that is. And I went to a club up there, really nice guys. Did a bit of rolling roll with one of their purple belts. Really nice, flowy roll. This big white belt, like, <clears throat> struts over. He's, oh, fancy a round? Like, yeah, no worries, so mate. something to prove. Yeah. And, yeah, just just being careless, mate, left my arm out. And he just went, bang, cracked on this, like, straight arm lock. <laughs> I, like, rotated out of it, but my fucking elbow cracked. And uh, when we finished, he took his gear off. And the guy was just jacked. And then it turns out he was actually a blue belt, yeah. but had forgotten his belt, so they stuck a white belt on him. Brilliant. So I'm like, mate, like you're jacked, you've obviously got an attitude problem, and you're a blue belt. Yeah. <laughs> and cheers, mate. Yeah, cheers, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, wonder, I, wonder, I wonder when to light, yeah. Yeah, so you've got to be careful, I think, mate, with um, yeah, the rolling. No, 100%. I mean, it's my first, like, like significant injury, so I've been quite lucky Is at it? the moment. Yeah, yeah. Been how, quite lucky. how long have you been training for? About six years now. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah that's I'm, good going, I'm mate. pretty relentless. Yeah, like I'm, I'm either all or nothing with things. Yeah, okay. So I can't just do things half assed. Yeah. So if I'm in, you know, that's what I was saying about this setup. It's professional, and it's like how how you're talking about how it escalates. Yeah. Is because you want it to be the best it can be. Yeah, we're the so same. We're the you're same. Gonna do it or you're not. <laughs> yeah, and that's why I was really impressed with it because it's like not just any any setup. It's you know this is gonna bar in a, a proper re recording yeah. studio. You've done an amazing job here. So it's um, but I'm like that. It's either in or out. Mm -hmm. you're going to do something or you're not yeah. which causes its, its problems but <laughs> yeah. yeah long time it should pay off for me well we fucking hope mate we can try right let's do a quick intro mate and then we'll just dive straight in yeah let's yeah. do it yeah. and welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast please like our video and subscribe to our channel today's guest is a current serving Royal Marine Commando he's an MBE BJJ Purple Belt Mo Morris how you doing good mate how are you yeah good thanks very much for having me on really appreciate it no pleasure mate and thanks for coming down it was a bit of a trip were you based in Exmouth? Yeah, yeah, not yeah, about an hour away, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah so not, not, too, not too bad, not too bad. Yeah, good man. And, I mean, there's a ton that we want to talk about today, mate, but I want to start with Beachfront BJJ because I've seen it popping up now for a couple of years and I can't quite work out if it's, if it's a gym, if it's like seminars, what is it? Can you explain? Yeah, so, um, so it's, uh, it's a, it started out as a bit of a passion project mm -hmm. um, and I was, you know, me and Ricky Bellingham um, created it from from the outset, and we almost went. We was having a we was having a coffee um, in Ocean in Exmouth in the play area. Kids were in the in the soft play, and we was having a chat about jujitsu and that. And literally from, you know, from nothing to eight weeks later, we pretty much had an event, a brand, and we were good. We were good to go. Um, and so the concept was very much about uh, why do people do jujitsu. What is it about jiu-jitsu that they really like? Um, and trying to give give more than what want, want than than just training. Mm. So you, I often found that jiu-jitsu people use it as a coping strategy, or just as an escapism, or you know progression and everything else that we we love love about jiu-jitsu. But 
a lot of the camps, a lot of the events is, uh, that that would be provided would only focus about the stuff on the mat. Mm -hmm. And actually, the reason why people are running away to the mats, or the reason why they want to escape from the mat or to the mats, is to forget about the the daily life, the business as usual, because it's been stressful, or there's stuff that's happened, or or whatever it might be. And actually, all that some people not all but all some people would be using jiu-jitsu for is to deal with the consequence not the cause mm. so so we wanted to provide some off the mat education and so you know there's on the base based on the fact that jiu-jitsu is an emerging sport in comparison to a lot of established sports there's a lot of um i would say amateur processes that still happen in the sport because the, this don't know it's not it's not had that maturity level yet so if you look to say rugby or football which is well established sports they take the the athletes certainly at the elite level and 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 filter down through the leagues will take sleep recovery nutrition very seriously when they're competing and i didn't find that that was something that was what some people do some people don't um so we wanted to provide off the mat education as well and so the, we you know, in cool locations by by the beach. So we you know set this thing up, and and yeah, we, we've had some amazing uh, like world class instructors, but also some really really cool seminars um, to, that covers performance psychology, that cut that uh, performance nutrition. We've had breath work, we've had sleep education, etc. So that what that does is and allows like the everyday person to access this stuff to help them when they're not at the gym. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of on and off the mat. Yeah, it's wicked, man. And and do you, are you just based in one location, or do you do you take it on the road at all? Yeah, so at the moment, at the moment, um, at the moment where uh, the, the event is just one location in Exmouth, um, it's like you know we're only, only two years. The, the business is only two years old, really. So um, next year, going to be looking at um, moving maybe to the southeast as well, yeah. um, and then looking at a um, potential higher end retreats. Um, maybe abroad and we'll see what happens but it's a real challenge because the jiu-jitsu market the people in it are either tight or skin or skin <laughs> yeah. um, generally speaking and that's why like jiu-jitsu is so cool because it's it's accessible to everybody of, of all financial um, financial persuasions um, but obviously to make a business you need to earn money so um, trying to have something reasonably priced and then also try to convince people that would put mats down in like a cow barn to train for free in the winter because that's just what they do. Mm. And then say to them, oh, can you part with a couple of hundred quid to come on this event? They're like, well, I would do that. I pay like 30 pound a month to go and train five times a week. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to articulate that value, which is, um, which is uh, proving a challenge, but you know, getting there and you know, it's growing and the numbers are getting better every year. So mm. can't complain too much. Yeah, brilliant. So how many events have you run now? So this would be uh, event number four this summer. Yeah, yeah. And what sort what who have you got coming for, for this summer's event? So we've got um uh he's probably better known as uh Choke Some More. Oh, I think you've had, had him on, on Miko. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Miko's coming down, he's gonna do the Saturday, which is gonna be a gi day. And then we've got Rosa Walsh, um, Fionn's first black belt. So yeah, okay. he's gonna be our first female instructor, which Great. I'm really happy about. Um really cool. So she's gonna be doing the, the um basic no gi sessions on the Sunday, um, this day and weekend tickets um available. So um yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. It's it's, it's just a just a cool event mm. um, and the venue is amazing it overlooks the beach yeah, nice. as well so yeah um, sort of lucked out a little bit yeah, in terms yeah. of it also and do you end up in the water at the end of it as well typically yeah so like if they choose I mean I um, I promote cold water but it's not my favourite I'm not going to lie <laughs> I much prefer hot water uh -huh. um, but obviously as the event owner I have to go in the sea as well so uh, November was quite interesting we went in the sea I like, did a cold water dip in the uh, in the uh, in the lunchtime, but last summer we went in in the morning um, for people that wanted to do it. So uh, that was yeah. a bit fucking disgusting. It's not it's not my jam at all. See, yeah, like Ben always does it, doesn't he? Ben Wallace's always yeah. in the fucking sea, and I'm like, oh mate, yeah. not for me. Yeah, mate, it's because he's off. He's, he's a lunatic. <laughs> yeah, he is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I love him, but he's a lunatic. And uh, yeah, it's not my not my jam, but. You know, I'm I'm down to my shorts in November, and I'm looking at the sea, smiling, <laughs> but in, the, in my head, I'm thinking. <laughs> no chance I'm like, but you just have to get in and do it because yeah, everyone's yeah. looking at you as well so yeah, yeah no it is a good crack it is a good laugh yeah fair play and, and you mentioned about obviously the off the mat like topics have you got anything in the diary for, for the summer event as well yeah so that? yeah so um, we've got on the Saturday he's going to be uh, 
breath work and cold water therapy actually funnily enough and then Sunday I've got um, a performance psychologist um, he's the only professor of human performance in the country Andy McCann he's coming down on the Sunday to look at um, uh, areas like pre-competition routines and um, you know process over outcome fear of failure that sort of stuff I mean we don't have a massive window um, and there's always more that we can cover, but then if we did it all in one, we wouldn't have any, anything left for other events. So um, yeah, some really, like these, the people that we get in not on, on, on the on the mat are excellent, off the mat are equally excellent in their own fields um, to the point where, you know, we've got on online seminars coming up as well, um, all PhD level um, deliveries that people can just dial in from the comfort of their own home to learn about PT, nutrition, female health, I think it's one of them. So um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. And it's just trying to get that. It's trying to, it's trying to understand, get people to understand that, that the information we've got and we're offering is useful to them when they don't think that it is because they don't know anything about it. Yeah, it's an interesting point I was going to ask because, yeah, I mean, we work in, in sort of health and fitness as well. And I, I work sort of in public health um, for, for a healthcare charity. And quite often, you're right, people don't, they don't know what they don't know, right? So they don't always understand why they're feeling the way that they're feeling. And they wouldn't necessarily go, well, I could use a bit of that. I could use a bit of that. Like, how have you found that the, the guys and girls that have been coming to the mat events, how have they received the other stuff? Has it been well? It has actually. Um, that's to refine it a little bit um, in terms of like length, people's uh, attention spans, you know, that sort of stuff, because the last thing they want to do is be lectured at. But the content is amazing. It really is good. And it's really sort of hard hitting, um, in, like to the point um, information. You know, I've had messages like when we did the sleep education, you know, sleep is something that everyone does for like 33% of their life or should do, right? Because it should be about eight hours, right? Um, and it's also a subject that people know very little about, but is fundamental for performance. Like part of my work in the Marines is um, we, we deliver uh, performance education um, and I, I do some performance consultancy as well. And um, sleep is arguably the most important thing if anyone wants to look at their performance in anything, any day life, before they touch anything else is looking at their sleep routines because it's like the science behind it is incredible. And I've had messages from people that have been on after that particular session and said it's changed. Like I just, I've now, I'm now waking up at the same time and it's like I've given that a try for a couple of weeks. It's changed like how I feel, I feel much better because I had a regular sleep patterns. Um, it's like, unbelievable the how powerful it can be so yeah the feedback's been pretty good um so far that's good and the sleep ones are funny isn't it because it's going back a few years you went for this phase didn't you especially on social media where you've got these like gurus and these authorities on social media saying like you know sort of work hard sleep five hours a day i think even arnie might have said you know like just sleep quicker like just <laughs> sleep faster and get out of bed earlier and do more. But now it's becoming quite clear that, as you say, sleep's super important and actually to perform high, you're right, the sleep's really important. What what was the, like, the biggest takeaway from that seminar that you could kind of maybe give the audience in regard to what they can do to improve? In sl sleep specifically, yeah. um, it's probably a couple of top big hitters, I would say, is, um, is one, consider your daytime routine. Everyone focuses on the action and so how do I compare this? So you, you like you said, you, you, you're involved in PT. Mm. Lifting a weight actually um, rips the muscle and it's the recovery phase that builds it to make it stronger. How you feed it, how much you rest it, yeah, what you do with it afterwards, right? So the act of sleeping is, is, is not necessarily ripping the muscle, it's really good, but it's the daytime management also affects your sleep cycle. So if you've had a really, really stressful day, and you're particularly sensitive to sleep anyway. The chances are that night that you're not gonna you're not gonna um, get a very good night's sleep because the daytime affects it. So I think understanding what your daytime routines are, caffeine intake, um, as an example, um, whether you drink alcohol in the evening or not, even if it's a nightcap, you know, the research suggests that being on the limit of drink driving on an evening, which is not a lot, a pint maybe, like a, a glass of wine for some, it will um, it will affect your sleep recovery that night by up to 50%. Really? Like wow. Si Fucking significant, hell. significant. Um, you know, everyone, it's a really interesting one because sleep is 
is very personal and individual. So what works for me might not work for you two, and what works for you might not work for us two. And so um, it, it, the analogy that I, I once heard was, if you go to a training shop and you want a size, a pair of size uh, sevens that of the new training that's out, and they said, oh, sorry, we only do eight. We only do size eight. So that means that most of the population aren't gonna get any trainers. Mm -hmm. But the reason why they, they cater for sort of different body shapes is because everyone's got different sizes and sleep's very much the same um, as that. It's very much about what works for you. Um, but daytime management is one. Uh, wake up time, consistent wake up time, mm -hmm. which is different to get out of bed time. Mm -hmm. So you can wait, like even at, like people say, I just need a lion. The research will suggest that you should go to bed earlier than get out of bed later. And the reason for that is that um, if you can imagine flying back from New York to London, it's about a five hour time difference. And come, certainly whenever I come back from the States that to, to the UK, that, that jet lag is really yeah. quite difficult yeah, for me to get much. over, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about maybe like you were normally waking up at six every morning and in a week, and then you'll get out of bed at 11 or wake up at 11 because you've had a lie-in, Never mind the alcohol from the Friday and Saturday nights. Um, we'll park that for now, but let's just go for the, the wake up times. That's about a five hour time difference. And what starts to happen is then you're on, on the on the on the Monday, you'll be um, potentially experiencing something called social jet lag. So it it dysregulates your circadian rhythm. So without being too robotic about it, and I always go with Pareto's law, it's like 80-20 rule. If you can get something right 80% of the time, you get 20% fudge, so you've got a bit of like swag in there. Um, wake up time is, is, is quite important to start regulating that. And then you'll start to find that you'll wake up before your alarm and you'll start to feel sleepy. Um, and then third bit is listen to your body at night. So often we will, we will watch Netflix or whatever it is, and they're really fucking clever because you'll watch an episode, they'll deliberately go, want excite you, I want to watch the next bit. And then it's next episode starts in yeah. three, <laughs> two, and you're like, you've pressed the button before it's even happened, yeah. right? And instead of your, your melatonin release and you're like this, you go next episode. And the next thing you know, it's one o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So it's like, listen to your body, watch the Netflix, like be patient, watch, you know, uh, like take control of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could talk about a subject all day. It's, mm. it's hugely important, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's something that I've, I've had an interest in before because I've previously had really bad sleep and it's much better these days. Mm. Interestingly, I've been on quite a low calorie diet recently, so I'm sleeping like a baby at the moment, which is lovely. <laughs> but other things that I've done in the past as well were obviously the, it, it seems like an obvious thing saying out loud, but I think a lot of people don't do it, but obviously room temperature and, and noise, mm. sort of making sure it's dark in there. Um, and also obviously... I know some devices now have the night modes, but you know, sort of a lack of actual daylight and obviously late night screen use. Do you find that's a, a bit of a factor as well? Yeah, I mean, the so there, there's studies like, um, you know, if you look, if you go back historically and look at um, humans, we are wired to connect with nature. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, when we were Neanderthals roaming the planet, our chimp was very much dominant. It was fight, flight, off, flight, freeze. Other tribes with spears, lions, tigers, bears, etc. cetera. Um, we need to hunt, eat, sleep. And we would rise with the, rise with the sun and go, go to sleep when it went down again. Um, Industrial revolution kind of changed that a little bit. Um, it's the invention of lights and timings and whatnot, nine to fives. And all of a sudden then in the last sort of like 10, 15 years, probably a little bit more than that, is the invention of blue light. So blue light is um, is a stimulant to stay awake, but more importantly, you know, as we were just discussing before this about the creation of content um, mm -hmm. reels, you know, the, the the companies know what what you want to watch and it yeah. streamlines it's it so all. So, easy, so the scroll the, the scrolling is probably the issue rather than the blue light for some because you're addicted and all of a sudden you've lost forty five minutes of your life <laughs> from ten second yeah, shorts. Mate, yeah. One of, my, one of my clients this week told me that she her TikTok daily time is six and a half hours. Oh, and I was like, how is it six and a half hours? And she's she's got a sedentary job where she sits in an office mm. and she's just basically a receptionist. Yeah. Um, for a, a, In a company that has virtually no one in the building anymore because they all work from home. Mm -hmm. So she literally just says to me, I'll sit there. S six and a half hours, average, average mm -hmm. a week. And th this is the thing, like when, and she knows that, she says this, she, she, she like last week, she said, I've actually got a problem. I've got, got a, like, she started limiting her screen time. 
You know, you can do it like where yeah, you get yeah. an app and it locks it. So after like three hours, she's like, if, you, you, if, you, if you think about it, if you think about it this way, right? If you think that trying to train jujitsu six hours a week for the for the normal person is, is a it's lot, a lot right? yeah, yeah. it's a lot. So she's doing that every day. So let's just take the working day. It's 30 hours a week that that she is looking at TikTok, the time that's wasted. I literally said to her, you should start doing online degree. <laughs> yeah, or I, language. I said to her, if you're or, sat there for six hours a, a day, I was like, go and get an online degree or an access course to get an A-level or something and expand your, your mind rather than sit there like that. The, you know, because if, you look, if you're looking at the maths, for someone to be like the, the, this, looking at the data, it's like about a thousand hours to become proficient at something or, or you know, in, in moving into the expert field. She's, she's hanging out a minimum of 30 hours a week. You know, that's like 120 hours a, a month. That's a thousand hours in a year. She uh, could yeah, be an, yeah. a, amazing at something. It, I know it's not gonna be that concentrated, but it's a huge amount of time. It's a huge, yeah. And, and, and she's just one example of, of people doing that now. Yeah. And then, you know, she says it does affect her life as in like it does, you know, just her attention span is what she talks about a lot. She's like, I, I'm, she struggles now to watch a film. She said to me the other day, she was like, I struggled to watch a film because I get, I, I get 30 minutes in and I'm bored, mm -hmm. 20 minutes in. And she just like, yeah, turn it off, boom. So there's there's some research in um, in uh, on the west coast Silicon Valley. And they they were looking at a four and a half hour working day. And it was like amazing. How good's that? And so they would chunk it down to match your circadian rhythm, ninety minute ninety minute ish cycles. Mm -hmm. So they'd do two cycles in the morning, two in the afternoon. So you know around that time. But the ninety minute cycles would be deep focus work. So your serotonin levels are the highest in the morning. Um, when you when you're when you when you've woken up and you're turned from the anaphor into a person, and you know as you as you as you hit um, sunlight hits your the optic nerve, it you know, generates all, all all that good stuff without getting too deep into it. So your creativity creativity is the best in the morning, generally speaking, for a lot of people. So they look, but then to do the ninety minute cycles, you need deep focus, and like you just said, most people now haven't got the attention span to be able to sit deep focus work for that circadian rhythm. And so that the, the issue that they were finding was not necessarily the output because there was they were, they were looking at multitasking being um, wasting around about three to four working days a month where you have got your computer open, your phone goes, you're trying to do a document, an email comes up, door knocks, like all that, the, the time it takes, not just to switch from one, but to get back into what you were doing is significant. They were looking at that from an output perspective. So go, well, if we could, but the issue that they were facing was that people's attention span and focus was really, like you just said, is really difficult because that's just not what we're accustomed to now. Yeah, we, we talk about it all the time, don't we? Like when we're trying to do projects for this or our own new business that we're starting, we're like, we need focus time because sometimes when you're at home, we can't get that focus time. Well, I can't, you know, because the same thing, I'll be on my laptop and I'll be like, right, but we'll start. And then it's, yeah emails this that the other family whatever but most of the time mate it'll be me going oh it's instagram oh click that what's that message boom and then i'm looking at reels and then i'm like but for the podcast but again like i'll be 30 minutes later and i'll be like fucking hell i've, I've just deviated so far gotta get back on track and i do that all make no the time. mistake though that these the companies that that are creating this software they will have psychologists etc knowing that the reason why you're looking at your phone every two minutes without realizing what you're seeing on the screen is because you're searching for that dopamine here. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the addictive behavior that they know that you're going to create by giving you the things that you want to see. Yeah. So trying to break that cycle. And you know, if you turned your phone off for a couple of days, the first like the first part of that segment would be really difficult. It's like withdrawal. Yeah. But then you'd be like, I feel a bit, I feel free from this. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, but they, they do it deliberately. They know how, how it's we even how work, respond. It? Like as this podcast has grown and doing better, I went for a phase of constantly looking, oh, how many, how many followers we got? Oh, we were 150 followers today, but you know what I mean? Or this many views or whatever. And you think, I'm just fucking addicted to it. You deleted it, didn't you? At one yeah. point from your phone completely. I do during the like week now, mate. So I've obviously got a day job um, and that involves a lot of like governance and policy writing and that type of thing. So I've got to get into work. Yeah. And I find that if I've got my phone anywhere near me um, or if I've got the apps on my phone, like I'm just like, exactly as you said, mate, I'll be like, and then I, I, and it's just then paralysis for analysis. I'm just like, all these things going on, I can't do anything. And I just waste half a day. So how do you deal with that? How, how do you do, deal with that then? What do you do? So, so the first thing that I do is just delete the apps. Okay, yeah. So I don't have quick access. So it's like a couple of barriers 
um, between like me and 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 looking at the content. Um, and then I've removed my phone from the room. Um, and I might say, right, like similar to you, I'll, I'll say, right, 90 minutes. Um, and then I'll go and look at my phone if I want. Yeah, so okay. I'll just do 90 minutes of work and I'll just like pretty much lock myself in the office and, and not leave. It takes a lot of discipline to do that. It takes a lot of practice as well, mate. It, it wasn't something that I got good at straight away and I'm still not perfect by any means. And I was going to mention a second ago because things like ADD and ADHD seem like to be a bit of a buzzword at the moment. And there, there are certainly people that have a, a sort of, you know, sort of a neural diversity thing with that and, and probably do have genuine attention deficit disorders. But I wonder how many people don't have actual ADD or ADHD, but are just so shit at concentrating that they think they have it. Well, you know, you know, it's an interesting point. Um, and I, I mean, I, I, I don't know what the actual statistics are just from, but from my experience of having you know, three young children, um, I think there is a, there's definitely a social pressure now to deliver for your kids more than there ever has been. So I can tell you now that every day of the week, my kids have got, there's three of them, and there will be one slash two different activities of, of that is outside of school every day of the week. Same as my boy. Horrendous. And that's something, often there'll be like two or three different locations. We've got to go, we've got to lift chairs. It's, it's a nightmare. And I think that if we just stopped doing anything and they just, like with Easter now, the boredom, they wouldn't be able to cope with the boredom. So it's almost like we're, we as a site aren't helping that either. And then they, they get a phone and it's like just constantly filling time. Where they, they, they don't know, you know, and I'm saying this now and it's like something to try and rectify, but they just don't know how to sit mm. and just be. Mm -hmm. I purposely take my lad to jiu-jitsu, rugby, football, all this stuff so that it gets him off of his computer. Mm. And that's sad, but all of his mates, they don't they don't go and meet down the park. They all get on FIFA and play a tournament. So if he's not playing the tournament with them, he's the outsider. Rather than playing and actual football. Actual football, yeah. So I, I, I'm like, now we, we have like a, base, a deal where I'm like, you, you go and do your club you know, he does want to do it, but sometimes he's like, oh, I can't bother. But if he comes home, he'll come home, do his homework, and then he will just want to sit on his PlayStation all night. You know, so I'm like, he's kind of got to earn it. So I'm like, right, you go jujitsu. After jujitsu, you do your homework, and then you have your tea, have a bit of chill time, and then you can go on it for an hour and a half. You know what I mean? But if he had his own way, what his friends do is come on, boom, straight on it. No clubs, whatever. And you're right, you have that pressure. If you, if you want to be like, if you want to be a good parent, you feel like you want to be a good parent. You you feel like an obligation to get him away from it because you don't want them so addicted to it. And he is, he, even with his phone and everything, you know, as soon as he gets in the car, I'll pick him up. He's like, yeah, boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, get off it. And he's like, yeah, sorry. And he is good with it, but naturally that's what he's doing. You know? Yeah, it is, it is hard, isn't it? Because then... They've grown up with it. To, to offset, yeah, to offset playing like being lost in a computer game, which, are, yeah, there's nothing wrong with playing computer games. Yeah, well, Provides balance, not. right? Everything's yeah. balanced. You then fill that time and it's the, it doesn't matter. It's the filling of time, which then becomes the issue. And going back to what you said about people then start getting agitated because they're, they're focused. It's just what they know. They know that they just need to fill time. If they, do, you know, if you imagine getting on a bus, how many people of a certain age, maybe say, I don't know, um, I'm pulling that punch in here, but say under 60 or over 60, I'll be looking at their phones. They probably won't because they're used to just sitting and being. Mm -hmm. If you start then going down the age brackets, they'll be heads down scrolling. My lad gets a coach to school, so I drop him off and he goes Bombies. to the bus 20, 20 minutes and he's just on his phone. I know he is because he just says, he says, yeah, I'll watch it. He, you know, the other night he didn't charge his phone. You thought he was like, he left it in my car and he was like, dad, I need it. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I have to have it tomorrow. And I, I was like, yeah, you have to just for safety. I want him to take it. Obviously he goes. Yeah, going back to the sleep thing, I think that's another point that, that people maybe struggle with as well. I find that, if I've had a really busy day with my mind, so I've been working, you know, just jumping from one thing to another, be on social media, when it comes to bedtime, if I've not had any kind of mindfulness or any time to just mm. be, relax, daydream, when I then get into bed, that's only the moment that my brain's like, oh, okay, we can now process today's thoughts. Mm. And then I get the, the thoughts going and then I can't sleep. Whereas I find that if I've had a period of time in the day yeah. where I've just sat there in quiet, been out for a walk, done some physical activities, but just allowed my mind to be free of, of input. Um, I find that just helps me sleep so much better. So I, I love an analogy <clears throat> to explain things. 
And um, I, from a really good friend of mine uh, who's an exeter, actually, he said, if you can't explain something to somebody that a 10-year-old couldn't understand, then it's too complicated. Yeah. And that's not to put a 10-year-old down. I mean, my daughter's 11 and she is like clever. Um, but sometimes we are often a little bit too complicated in the way we explain things. But to try and um, put an analogy on that, if you can imagine a Formula One race car, um, the whole point of that racing car is to, f is to finish as high as it possibly can do over, over say 60 laps or whatever it is and there's a whole team around that race car to, to make that happen there's a whole pit stop strategy throughout that race to make that happen um, and an understanding on uh, the, the, the morning of the race on how the car's looking and how it's, how it's operating and what the weaknesses are the strengths are of it the, the weather can, the, the whole the variables if you were to replace that race car with you as a person in the, in the day then you can't finish your day in sixth gear at maximum revs because if a race car racing a formula one car did that by the time it got to 20 laps the gearbox would be knackered because mm. a high performance engine now i'm not saying that you know but just go with the concept so it has to manage itself it has to come in for pit stops get some fuel might need not a tire change depending on the weather conditions it might and it but that pit stop might not be the same time every race every every time it goes out on the track because of the conditions that it's in because of the the way that the car is before it starts anyway you 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 have different pit stop strategies one two three four maybe whatever it might be different things happen you get to the end of the day goes into the garage the mechanics then get to look at the car get a bit more time on it to allow the car to recover before the next race if you view your day like that where it's one thing to another what are your pit stop strategies throughout the day because when you you cannot focus for six hours, you can't on nine hours or whatever it is, you can't do that. So it's planning in that recovery time, your daytime management for sleep, like you've just said. And your first pit stop might be you get you get to work, um, and then I don't know, ten o'clock. It's a 10, 15 minute outside, regardless of the weather, water intake, some sort of food that's gonna be conducive to your energy levels. Um, listen to a listen to something, read for five minutes, whatever it might be, and go back in again. If you think about Dave Brailsford's marginal gains when he when he took over uh, Team Sky um, and GB Cycling, like looking for the one percenters, what we often will do is we will um, lose one percenters over the course of uh, a working period. So in the Marines, we have terms, and um, so now we're on two weeks leave. Um, so it's a, it's a massive garage moment, shall we say? But over the term, it's the, 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 the degradation of the one percenters, which then allow, doesn't allow us to be optimally perform like we were before because our recovery is not good. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at um, a day where you think, oh, what's 15 minutes going to do to me? Actually, if you looked at it saying, well, it's going to prevent me losing a 1% today over six weeks, that's 6% and you know, so, so on and so forth. That's a big percentage you're saving yourself to be able to allow yourself to be um, better the f when you wake up the next day mm -hmm. and manage yourself mm -hmm. in the same way that a Formula One car, as I said, can't just go max chat to the end because it just won't survive. Yeah. Um, but we often think that we can. Mm -hmm. We just go, no, it's fine. Just load the day, load the day, load the day, and end up we have a crash, mm -hmm. you know, as, as it were. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I love that analogy. It's quality. It's good. Um, going back to PJJ for a second. Um, obviously, we talked at the very beginning about you know, how people use BJJ as a bit of a crutch at times to, to kind of leave their, their sort of business as usual problems. Why do you think BJJ has such a profound impact on people's sort of mental health and why do you think it's so good for people? I used to play rugby and in an 80 minute, minute match, you're not involved in everything. And sometimes, if you certainly, I never, I never was, I had the pleasure of having a lot of speed, so I never played in the back, so I was always in the forward, so it was less, less so for me. But even then, you can still, sometimes you, you thoughts can drop in if the game's quiet. Um, if I, I, I find for me personally um, and others not, if I went doing anything long distance, I've got time to think. And I'm like, I don't really want that. <laughs> There's some, something I just don't want to think about stuff. I think gee, what jujitsu does is if someone's hanging off your neck, you don't think about, you're not, you cannot think about anything else other than that there and getting and that not happening it's like so um so uh impactful in the moment right there and then that you just cannot think about anything else and i actually quite like like that because it it's a complete blocker 
Now, some people that will run will say the same thing. They do, they can clear their head. But for me personally, I like the fact, fact that it's like a big door that shuts and says, not not now, not for this hour. And that, and it's a bit of a, like, a like you say, escapism, mm -hmm. which is why when we're talking about beachfront, it's like trying to, okay, well, let's not escape because if you're escaping something stressful, are you learning as much when you get on the mat? So if we can try and make that a little bit better, then you might absorb a bit more and progress a little bit quicker. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just, you know, when you're in that moment, mm. what else are you thinking about? You're not thinking about your, your, your shop at Tesco's. Yeah. You <laughs> if, if you are, you, you're <laughs> fucked, didn't you? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the truth. If you do have that moment where you think of something else. Or you're a black belt rolling with a white belt. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So you've got the space to do that. But yeah. But again, I think that's fucking that's rare, mate. I think even even then, I think you, they still they're still thinking, and they they're still in that moment. They're still in that moment. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's that's definitely a massive factor. I think we've discussed that before in a couple of episodes. I think another thing as well, and and you'll appreciate this massively because you're a military guy. But I think that that camaraderie and the brotherhood that you get as well, and obviously. You know, you've got your civvies that have never been in the military and, and some blokes have maybe never had that in their, their whole life. Um, and again, like we talked earlier about there's sometimes there's things that people need they don't know they need. And I think for a lot of guys that are isolated um, that maybe can, you know, have barriers up for one reason or another, I think when they find their way into jiu it can massively help. And of course, for military guys, certainly veterans that have had that and lost it potentially, regaining that, I think, as well is massive. Do you agree? Yeah, the, the, the sense of community is unbelievable in the sport there's so many parallels that i see from being in the military and in the jiu-jitsu world community um you know I, I've, I've played a lot of different sports at varying levels and the one thing that i can say is that like when as i say i play rugby if i play for a rugby team and i went i don't know to london i couldn't just pitch up at a rugby team and say i oh, any chance i could train tonight mm. they'd be like no because you don't play for us and, but the rugby club itself is an amazing place to be. Like, the, you know, and then they're in the right. But if you don't belong to that particular club, then you're, you're not very welcome. Do you know what I mean? Whereas jiu-jitsu is very much like, it's certainly a lot better than it has been. It's like, I can, I, I travel a lot. And I, I sometimes cold call some gyms. I've got gyms that I'll go and train at. So I'll train at Phoenix Southampton, Phoenix Bournemouth, 101 in, in Portsmouth. Elevate is my gym in London that I train at. Um, RJ Henley like if it, wherever I'm at I always find a gym they're like yeah come down come down and there's people that have got from a sport perspective very similar values and standards they, they just love the journey and that they and you get talk, chatting to people and you and your network just grows whereas you don't I can't there's not many other sports you can be that free with your training and cross training um, there are but there's not, not no, there's very not very stove pipes if you play for a team that's your team um, and actually, you know, that you, the, the community aspect of that, which is very much like the military, you can go to different military camps, and just by being in the military, it's like it's not overly friendly all the time, but it's uh, it's a known known. Yeah, if that makes sense. A home away from home. Yeah, it's probably a good good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. And I think even going back, I've been in out of jiu jitsu for years, and even going back sort of ten plus years ago, I remember there was a there was an occasion where I was potentially looking at moving with my job, and. I can remember thinking, like, have a little look. There's a couple of gyms there. Great, I've got mates. I've got mates there. Don't yeah. even, I don't know them yet, but I've got mates. So you're absolutely right. I think that's massive. It's the first thing you look for when you're going anywhere. Where's Jiu Jitsu? <laughs> yeah. Is there a, anyone know if there's, there's a gym in? You know, and there's, yeah, let's yeah, go and train up here. And, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's massive. And I think the other thing as well, and I'll be interested in your thoughts on this, but I feel like there's something in the, the kind of shared struggle of, of the physical adversity of Jiu Jitsu that breaks down barriers with, with especially guys, but I'm sure girls as well, where you know, you, you, I don't know, you, you see people opening up much more like on the mats to each other, you know, that they'll share like things that they might not tell other people. Do you find that as well? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good point. It's, it is an, an interesting one because you get to know someone over 30 second conversations mm -hmm. over a long period of time. Yeah. Um, rather than a massive exposure, you'll meet someone on the mat, say, all right, how's, how you doing? What's your name? Oh, what do you do? You know, all the, all the niceties are out of the way and then you might not speak to them until the next week. And then you say, Mike, you'll go back and say, oh, how was so-and-so? And you get to know people from that. It's a very, it's like speed dating. <laughs> yes. um, but on the Good mats, it, yeah, yeah. like, you know, for friends. Not to make jiu-jitsu any more gay, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now can you come and sit on my face um, whilst trying to, like, put me to sleep? So, um, yeah, and it, I think because it's, the, it's that environment, like, it's a safe environment. Um, 
and I'm I'm sure there are gyms like it, but they're very rare. Like where you you're not you're not you don't feel like you're not welcome if you go to places. You know, um, I know that the gym that I train at. I, I live in Exmouth, and my head coach is in Richmond in in London, and I still come under under there because like you know when you walk into a gym, sometimes you go, "This is where I'm supposed to be." That that's that's that elevate is that, that for me now, um, and so. You know, you walk in and it's just that it's a home away from home. When you find your place, it's a home away from home. Mm -hmm. And I think that people trust the environment and therefore then trust the people that's in it mm -hmm. because then you trust the instructors or the or the environment to oust anyone that's a dickhead. Mm -hmm. And generally that does happen. Um, um, not You don't often find too many dickheads in jiu-jitsu. There are, but certainly in that environment, they're, they're, they're not. Maybe off the mat they might be, mm -hmm. um, but... And so I think people feel safe, yeah. that environment to just chat about stuff and trust because they trust the club that they're in, they trust the academy they're in, they trust the people that they're with and therefore the conversation just happens. There's no taboo, mm. do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And how did you find jiu-jitsu, mate? When did you start and how did you come across it? Yeah, so I I, um, I used to do a little bit with Sam Sheriff, oh, uh, real, yeah. real um, owner. He was, we were white belts years and years ago. And then I decided I want to play rugby and Sam's gone on to do amazing things. You know, it's like, he's, 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 he's a brilliant guy. And um, I, I wanted to play rugby because that's what I used to play as a kid. And I got to like 35 and went, I'm starting to hate the recovery a little bit more. Like the body <laughs> just wasn't taking it. And I, I, I'm not someone that's got patience for golf or something that's more chilled out. Yeah. So just as it happened, I then started working with Sam up at Limston, the training center, Sam went, come back on the mats. And one of the reasons why I didn't, one of the reasons why I didn't train any time before that was be, it was probably a little bit of ego, well, not a little bit, it was ego, where I'm like, oh yeah, but I'm not as good as I used to be. And now that person who was a white belt is now a purple belt. Or like, you know, if you take some time off, sometimes like the ego will stop you from going back because you don't- We just talked about that yeah. before you come on air. Yeah, yeah. Someone you, don't, else. You, yeah. don't, you don't feel like you're, you're going to be, because there is a, there is a, um, there was, is without question without pecking order on ability. Mm -hmm. So even there might be blue belts that turn some purple belts over in an academy, right? That's just the way it happens. But So there's a pecking order. Everyone knows where their place is and, you know, and you're kind of comfortable with that. You know that if you roll with someone that you're going to get turned over, that's fine. And some other people you don't. But when you then start, if you have time off and you, you and too long, I mean, I had like nearly 10 years. Mm. It's like being new again. Anyway, Sam got me involved again. And I, I remember coming back after the session. It was like, <laughs> I mean, he, I remember he was, he was an open guy. He just grabbed my foot and I couldn't like just open grip. And I couldn't, I, I, and he's like, mate, just turn your foot and kick it out. I was like, all right, yeah, yeah. And it was like, just idiot again. And I think because I was like older as well, um, had some sort of a uh, stature in, in work, like going back to being like a sprog was also a factor as well. But I, after that session, I just said to Sam, thanks, mate. Thanks, thanks. And he, and, and he gave me a gi as well. Uh, after he gave me a gi and said, right, I want to see you on the mats again. It's good to have you back. And he's, he's really good like that. So anyway, started training again and then just, like we said before, it's all or nothing. Mm. It's like, it's in. Yeah. And then just, you know, like, you know, when you learn something, you think you get in this purple patch and you're like, I'm doing all right here. And then you roll with someone and all they do is like move an elbow and it just completely shuts oh, you down. Mate, I know. And you, and it, as you're, sometimes I'm rolling going, you need to show me what you did afterwards as we're, as we're sparring. And it's a Pandora's box just opens up again and you think that you know where you are. <laughs> right. And I remember the first time I tried doing legs, mm. I was like, I'm not great at legs. Mm. I, I don't want people on mine along. I'm just stay away from it. But I remember like legs, I'm thinking, I'm a, one, I'm a white belt on it mm. again. It's just another levels and like, but it really excites me because I'm like, God, there's so much to learn. Mm. Give me it, give me more, give me more. I want to progress. I want to get better on it. And I think that's what, you know, it's, a, it's an obvious pathway in jujitsu mm. for that. As frustrating as it can be, it's amazing as well when you hit something or you win something or you your promotions are just like off the off the chain. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's, that's where I'm I know at, what right. you mean though with that. Like, where you think you're getting somewhere. Like, I played, I play all the time, pull guard, <laughs> pull guard, and uh, I thought I had a like an all right guard developing, and then I I rolled with Sam Crook and Frank. They they're new instructors, and 
you pull guard and Sam just, mate, he'd like walked through my guard probably yeah, 500 yeah. times in an hour. And then Frank was doing the same and I was just like, oh, fucking hell, I am so shit. You know what I mean? Like I, I left it and I was just like thinking like, how the fuck is he doing that? How the f- and I, I know how he's doing it now because he's shown me. But, you know, it's like what you said, you only know what you know. So I, I was thinking like, because in our club, we, we they weren't, they weren't doing those really like aggressive knee cut passes. We just weren't taught that. We were like more of a, I don't know, like a pressure kind of style. Like, and they were like, boom, see you later, free your fucking guard, gone. And I, I just didn't know how to deal with it. And then you, you think, fuck me, man. Like, you know, everything you've worked on is gone. <laughs> yeah. And I think what you said as well about, you know, kind of being, you know, you've obviously got your rank, but depending on the different area yeah. of jujitsu, you may be varying in, in ability and, I think I, I agree certainly with the leg entanglement stuff that's relatively new and you know as I said I've, I've been in and out for years and I developed like a, a style of jiu-jitsu that didn't really have that as part of the game back yeah, like yeah. when I was doing it a lot and then when I've got back into it more recently that's a massive part of the game now we had Owen Jones down for a seminar recently and he was showing some of his stuff and I was like fucking, so fucking level, witchcraft mate. mate it's, 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 another uh, level, it's mate. like algebra yeah it's a complete algebra and you're like I don't know how you can, you know, an inversion as well, because then everything's upside down. It's yeah. like, <laughs> it's old dog, new tricks. Like, come on, like, what's going on? So, but the the, the one thing, the, the one thing that I, I love most about the sport, and there's so many, so many great things, physical, like yeah, the phys- uh, yeah, physical ability improves, your psychological ability improves, your community, all that stuff, is the synergies on the mat to off the mat are, um, are unbelievable. So you can go through, you can go training at uh, your club and you can do what you do and then someone learns something how to counter it and then you like plateau a little bit. You know, when you're learning something, you're thinking, I'm not, I just don't, I'm not fit. It's not, it's not clicking as much as it, it was two weeks ago and you're on a little bit of a down and you're like, and then training's a little bit hard because it's not like the same feeling and you go into training and sometimes you're just present. You know, you're still moving forward. Um, other times it's amazing and you do, and you're like I didn't realize that I could do that and it that's life as well sometimes like it's a bit shit life sometimes it's a bit good but it's never that forever um and whatever that moment is will always pass and I think jiu-jitsu is the same whatever you're doing you can like you say about guard now you, what you'll do is you'll go back and you'll learn right I need to defend against aggressive I mean, I've knee been, I've been passes. obsessed with it since yeah. I've been obsessed with it since so then I'm you elevate your game in that and it, it teaches you to do that whereas I think sometimes sometimes if you're not around that environment um, around people that are willing to grow and willing to get better then you just don't because you just plateau forever you're like well if that was a life situation where that would take place and it's not, and you were beaten or you were defeated or you were, you failed at something and there was no one around unless you're a very special type of individual you might then just think well I'll just avoid it next time mm-hmm. but actually jiu jitsu teaches you to go no 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 learn how to deal with it get better at that particular bit and so i think that 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 helps with confidence off the mat as well to be able to get get beaten in a competition and still go to training the next day because look, it, I lost. It's fine, and you learn to accept that failure is a good thing because mm-hmm. it learns, it teaches you where your weeks, where your, your blind spots are. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure that that is necessarily translated all the time in everyday walk of life. Yeah, no, that's very true, mate. I completely agree, and I think as well, you know, when you we kind of think about the ego, which we mentioned earlier as well, but you know, for again, just relating it to my work, where I'm in, you know, sort of a fairly senior position, and there's a lot of managing of politics within the organisation. And you see like a lot of people that they're kind of unwilling to budge on certain ideas and, and maybe they've made a mistake, but they don't want to admit it and they'll cover things up and it just creates a bit of a mess. And I find as a result of doing jujitsu in varying in various jobs over the years and varying levels of, of employment, I've always found that I've always been quite relaxed to sort of problem solving. Um, I've always been happy to admit that I'm wrong, always happy to accept other people's ideas, regardless of where they are in the organization. And you find this on the mats as well, right? You've got like black belts, white belts. All of them have got good ideas about stuff. And you learn over time to to take on board everybody's ideas and, you know, kind of also accept that maybe that's a better idea than your own. Mm. And I feel that transfer to life is massive as well. Yeah, there's, it's like almost like um, through osmosis, it just starts to change you a little bit and you don't realize it because it's against the one percenters. Mm. But 
where you were when you, as a person, if you could try and figure out where you were as a person when you first started jujitsu, and then put that as a marker to where you are as a person now, there is difference. There, Of course there's difference. There's maybe more confidence, maybe you're more relaxed about the fact that, okay, yeah, I might not win, but that's okay. Don't worry about it. Or that, you know, and it, it just permeates around. And I think that that is a, such a positive environment to be around, um, which if you lose a football, football match at the weekend, that's a big deal. I mean, don't get me wrong, losing a comp is not ideal. I'm not saying we should go to lose, but the environment is as is something where it's accepted that that is just part of it. Um, we, we you need to lose to learn. Whereas if you say you lost at football, they wouldn't necessarily see it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, not all, anyway. Majority. I'm, I'm not trying to tire everyone with the same brush in that respect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think um, yeah, that, that's the that's the most and the, the thing that gets me the most about the sport. And I think what you put in, you get out. Mm -hmm. That's that's the other thing with like rugby and football and stuff. You can hide. And team game you can hide you can have spurts of greatness and you can just fucking walk around and you can shirk your responsibilities a little bit jiu-jitsu you can't if you're not doing something right you, you get your head fucking popped off you know and, 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 I, and I, I'll, I'll give you an absolute classic example of this so there's a lot of um, my gym Frankie the little shit he's uh, I love him to bits love him to bits he's um, uh, working his way through um, uh, becoming a pro MMA fighter and he started jiu-jitsu after me and got his blue belt probably about a year after me. And it's not because I'm not trying to highlight that I'm particularly crap or good or anything, but just in terms of timelines, he got his purple belt the same day as me. And the reason why he got his purple belt the same day as me was because he has got the discipline to train three times a day. And the volume at which he's training starts to then differentiate between average. I train average, probably a bit above average, I think. I train like four or five times a week. Maybe the average is two or three, I don't know. He trains my volume a week. Uh, he trains my monthly volume in a week. So he's like, and when you roll with him, he's a lot smaller than me, wiry, little fucker. But um, he, he's a great lad, but he's like levels. He's just levels that he just goes and, you know, he's, he's just putting that time in. He's starting the difference. You just start to separate yourself because he's putting in and he's getting out what he's putting in. You know, it's and, and it, but it takes years to do that. It's not just like five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Five minutes difference is nothing. Add the five minutes up, yeah. and then that becomes years worth of difference. Um, and you're like, how did you get that good? The reason why he's got that good, and other people do the same, is because he just puts the volume in and he's dedicated his I mean, like discipline. A fucking Owen and Frank, they're ridiculous, yeah. aren't they? I know, like Owen's fucking flying, and he's he's 19, mate. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's like unimaginable how good he is at his age. And same with Frank, he's, you roll with him regularly and he's 18. It's ridiculous how good he is and how strong he is at 18. What's if he going to be like when he's 24? If you look at uh, Ricky, yeah. oh, Ricky, Ricky Bellingham yeah, is yeah. another one where he got his black belt probably eight years, maybe, maybe something like that. Yeah. And everyone goes, oh, that's quick. But if you look at the volume at which he is on the mat, whether it's teaching or training, that guy is like obsessed. Oh, he's dedicated, mate. It's well, I think it's an obsession. I think it's the next level up. Mm -hmm. He's obsessed with jujitsu to the point where he can't not be on the mat, whether it's teaching. And so the reason why it was eight years is because his average is not two or three times a week. Well, he he's doing he six, on, yeah. seven hours a day. Yeah, he said that when he came on here, mate. He said, he said people, you know, we got his brown belt in like five years or six years or something. Yeah. And he, he said, I'm, I'm doing four times as much as anyone yeah, else. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Doing, I'm doing 25 hours yeah. a week or something. Yeah. I'm just so, on the mat. So it's, it's five years is, is my 20 years. Yeah. yeah. And it so goes back, you, you get out what you put in. Yeah. He yeah. puts in five times the amount and, and everyone and, else. And look he what he's achieved and how good he is. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And I mean, it helps and, that he hasn't got a neck. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you, can't actually, you, you can't actually choke him. You can't give him because he's, he's like this and he's like a barrel. It's rock solid. <laughs> rock solid. You're trying to like it's like trying to wrestle a pig. Do you know what I mean? It's just nothing to grab hold of. He's like and he's very good as well. But yeah, he is, yeah. But I think I think on that note as well, I think it's important for people not to compare themselves to other people, right? For for that exact reason. Well, everyone's journey's different. Exactly. And and you know, I, I would love to train, you know, six hours a day, but I'm just not in a position to. And I have to accept that, you know, and appreciate the other things in my life. Do you, do you know, the reason why I sort of like took a big sigh on that is because the comparison thing is so, I think it's a... It's a FIFA joy, is, mate, it, it? is it an issue? Is it not? I don't know. But I think that training volume, you can comprehend. But because jiu-jitsu doesn't have a syllabus as such, 
it's done on opinion. Some academies, you could be training, like, I know that my coach, as an example, he is like, his threshold's quite high. He's first, he used to be Hodges' uh, training partner for comps. First, he's a first generation black belt, like, knows him really well. He used to train at RGA when they were like youngsters and stuff. So his threshold's quite high. Not to say that's a good or bad thing, that's just the way he does it. Other academies might be lower than that. So their threshold on what, or maybe even the commercial element of jujitsu to keep people interested might influence certain instructors to, without them realizing it, to promote people that on, and so, they're, so therefore comparisons become really difficult. And I had a bit of a problem with that um, myself with like, with, 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 um, with my promotion to Purple Belt because I, you've got to keep it in. It's not the sport that you can turn around and say, I think I'm being overlooked. And actually, I don't think I was overlooked. But when I compared myself to other people and when they got their belts and that, and it starts to eat away at you, really does. Like, am I good enough? Am I, am I worthy enough of this? Am I ever going to get it? Um, and you're seeing other people grafting as well, but you don't get to see that. But you just get to see the promotions and you're like, what... It's really difficult then to have, have motivation to keep going training, which is why then you have to have the discipline to keep going training. Mm -hmm. You've got to fight for it. And one of the guys that, guys that um, Elevate is a great guy. And he was just saying, mate, just keep training. Mm -hmm. Just keep training. And it's so true. It's so true. Um, but the comparison thing, because of the, the lack of syllabus, is really quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And even at comps, you've got different standards and people that are ringers that should have been promoted before but they haven't been and it's uh, is that, that 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 to me is the hardest probably the hardest bit about jiu-jitsu i think mm. is that is that is the um the self-reflection and then trying not to compare yeah yeah so difficult yeah and i think even you know sort of you know going with, with, even with comps you know there's there's obviously a large sort of athletic like element to that as well and and you know again going back to the whole jiu-jitsu thing about you know its opinion it, you know, absolutely is just right. And, but, you know, you've got, I don't know, 40 year old, really good understanding the technical stuff, 20 year old, less so, but an absolute stud, mm -hmm. you know, in sparring, the 20 year old's probably going to get the upper hand in many yeah. cases. So who's better? You know, it's a really hard one to judge, isn't it? Yeah, it's, um, like I'm 42 and I still want to try and mix it with purple belts that are younger than me. And it's like, I think that I can for a round. You know, when you do like open mat and you get to the hour, you're like, right, where's, where's the, you know, like when a, a hunter is um, looking for its prey, it takes the stragglers at the back, mm. you know, like 50 minutes in, you're going, right. <laughs> where's those white belts? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to survive. <laughs> um, you get the hard ones out of the way, but yeah, you're right. It's, uh, it's difficult and you know, there's so many variables to it. So it's never a direct comparison, which other sports, um, you know, if you, you, you would, you would in rugby or football, you'd be a veteran at 35 and you might not be playing first team football. Do you see what I mean? And that's there why is jujitsu is amazing, isn't it? Because you can do it all the way through, you know, you can, yeah. you can even compete all the way through if you wanted to. And I think jujitsu as well is something that's always overlooked is like people's actual decision making. That's always like, it's always like our oh, physical and what techniques they know and what this, but jujitsu a lot of time is making the right decisions at the right time and pulling the trigger at the right time. Now, some people are going to be better than that than others just naturally because they are better sportsmen or they're better at this, you know, or their, you know, their reactions are quicker or whatever. And then that can stay with them. So you can still be physically really good, but again, it's a lot of it's mental, isn't it? But, that, but even in with decision-making, I think like studies have shown that obviously fatigue levels will impact oh, decision-making yeah, yeah, massive. Yeah. So if you're unfit, you're going to be a yeah, worse yeah, decision-maker. Yeah. There's so many fucking and then you, to it. you revert to type, you revert to what you know. Um, yeah, yeah. therefore like learning how to be better at that stuff is really important so that it, it changes your changes your uh, default setting and I think who you're rolling with yeah. you know what I mean if, you, if I'm fucking rolling with you me. six foot five my game's going to be massively different if I'm rolling with fucking someone my own size you know I, like, I'm going to put myself out there now and say that I think that I don't think um, you know, like comp when we talk about competitions I think competitions are poorly run in full stop jiu-jitsu competitions they are not set up for the competitor they're set up for the competition oh yeah why, why do you think that because if you
go to it. I don't compete anymore mm -hmm. because I'm not paying a hundred quid to be told your start time was an hour an hour away. It's now in five minutes. Mm -hmm. That's not set up for the competitor. That's set up for the comp competition. And so when it, the and I'm not saying that the people that deliver competitions aren't aren't very good at organising them, but because they're doing what they know, um, and some competitions are really efficiently run. But that efficiency is often at the expense of the competitor. And how many times you hear when, because Smooth Comp is so good, it'll be like, you just come off and go, oh, you're supposed to be on now. You're like, what? Mm -hmm. That's not set up for the competitor. They've done that with me on my first comp, haven't yeah, they? It's, it's, <laughs> I was off, first ever one, straight back on. I was like, fuck, you know. And that is where I think that the sport's got some way to go in being better at what it does. Rather, it's, because it's moving away from being a sport that people didn't really know much about and it was like a real niche. Um, it was, you know, it could be very amateur. Mm. Now it's moving away and it's, it's getting, it, it's, it's improving in every area. And I think that, you know, I to have, there is no, if you look at it, for, for me to go down to compete, there's nowhere for my kids to go. Mm. All day stuck in a sports hall somewhere. There's no massage beds anywhere. There's no recovery areas for the for the for the competitors. There's no, you know, I'm not saying they provide it for free, but like it's just mats and a start time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't, I don't, um, I don't necessarily agree with the way that they're run because people are doing it because that's how they used to, that's how they've done it. And for you want the best fights and the best. Um, your, your best performance. You can't just turn around to someone and say, you're supposed to be on mat three and five now. I, I do find that differs though, depending on the you know, sort of, obviously who's running the comp. Um, I mean, I've I've been to countless regional events and been involved with a couple as well. And I agree that some of them have been absolute shit shows. Mm. I've also, I didn't compete, but I've been at the Masters Worlds. And that was a different level. Yeah. Because that, that was obviously in a, a big convention center. You did have massage beds and, and places yeah, that you yeah. could wander around and go. And the, throughout the day, they had on the screen everyone's times. And from memory, um, it, it seemed fairly spot on. Because you, you've heard like an empty mat is a, is a bad, uh, it's like an um, empty, empty mats is a bad, bad a poorly run competition. Because I actually think that's the other way. I think empty mats is a good thing for allow the people to recover. It might not be a great spectacle. Yeah. And there's nowhere for people to watch anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, there are, you're right. There are some comps that are pretty good at trying to allow that time. Mm. So, um, how, so how would you do things different? We run comps at, uh, in the military. Smooth comps gives you a start time, right? Mm. Keep start time. Unless there is a significant change in attendees of people not turning up and you've got like half an hour, you know, whatever, like or, or significant keep the times the same people know they, they, like, people know what time they're, they're, they're going to be competing at people know what time the finals are going to be um, people do, people just know or it's or it's a it's a to be able to make sure it is properly structured to give more than about because you can set the terms and conditions on the on the on the mm -hmm. thing some they just want to it feels like some comps just want to get it done yeah I just feel they need to make it more of a, a spectacle at times as well. Like maybe a bit more emphasis on the fighters, maybe less mats, more, I don't know, seating. I don't know, make it feel like more of a, an event. But I think that's part of the problem because if you're, if you're trying to make something a spectacle and you've got multiple mats and they're empty, you're like, fuck, this is shit for the yeah. fans. And then you're rushing people to get them on the mat. So it's, it's a tricky one. I think where you've got like Polaris and, and those professional jiu-jitsu yeah, events, great, that's, that's different they're because great, they can make that spectacle, but the tour de bon knockout style ones, it's a bit... Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what, what is, the one that is pretty good though um, is British Open because mm. they have got the bleachers for people to sit. Yeah. It is more comfortable. They've got the, the, the venue, yeah the, yeah, the one that Braulio runs is, is pretty good um, and that is definitely catered for. Yeah. Um, but I think sometimes people just say, right, I'm going to do a jiu-jitsu competition and just miss the person. Um, out of it and they're the ones that are paying yeah and like I'm, 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 I've been to a couple where I'm like alright I'm going I'm not waiting like you know when you do gi and no gi and that's fine because you've got to wait for them to finish but like it can be like five hours I'm like walking like a freaking stiff board but I'm like I'm, right, I'm out of it I'm not doing it you often get like atrophy of of competitors throughout yeah. the day yeah. like, I'm just going and that's fine I get that but I think that we need I, to I definitely think add more value the experience isn't the best. I'd, I'd say from a competitor's point of view, the experience of the a day of competing, like what you just said, isn't the best experience for the competitor. 
And I don't know how they would fix that. And I think it's people that are way more clever than us that would come up with ways to fix that. But I think, you, like you said, you can be competing in the gi in the morning and then no gi at four o'clock in the afternoon. And then you're just sat, sat around waiting in the fucking hall all day. And I think that, 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 that is a part of what puts people off. You know, there's so many people that I speak to just in the gym and whatever. They're like, oh, fucking shit day, innit? Shit day, traveling three hours and sat in a hall all day. I don't know how they'll fix that. Venue selection, I think, is uh, is an important one, definitely. Because I think sometimes you... And look, at the end of the day, these people are trying to run a business as well. So, mm. But they look at the venue and see how many competitors have we got, vice, or what do we want, vice, how many mats do we need? And like spectators are just shoved in. So then you might find, well, if I'm going to take, take my kids up there and they're just shoved in, do you think I'm going to compete very well if kids are unhappy and they're hungry? They've got nowhere to sit. They've got nowhere to... So I just don't go. So, and there'd be other people in the same boat that, or I go to the competition invariably at weekends and then can't then deliver the football uh, run or, the, or go and take yeah. ballet or gym yeah, or whatever yeah. it is. And it's, like, it's, a real, um, it's a real issue. So I think, you know, trying to, trying to make it a more of an experience, a positive experience for everyone, I think you'll find that the, the people go, oh, that was really good because, and it, and it, and it will it will improve, mm. definitely. But my, my biggest bugbear is like, yeah, you're on in like five minutes. You're like, <laughs> yeah, are you joking? All, all that yeah. Are you joking? I'm like a 42 year old heavyweight. <laughs> <laughs> I need some more time to recover I before fucked, I go on mate. against him who's just had a bite. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, that's not right. <laughs> it's not <Yeah>. right. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is true, mate. Mate, I wanted to get into your uh, your military career a little bit because it sounds like you've done some amazing things. You've obviously got your MBE for your work in the military, I think. Can you tell us about that? So I think you joined in 2001. Uh, where did you grow up? I So I was South West London. Okay. Um, grew up on a, on a estate in South West London. Um, and um, yeah, in Kingston. So not far away from where I train uh, Richmond, actually. So, um, but Richmond's the posh part. Um, Kingston's all right actually it's not too bad um, and then yeah so lived at home and ended up ended up joining um, nine, when I was 19 and uh, it was I remember the last it was I remember watching the news I was about to go on holiday with my dad my mum and dad split up um, so we were, my dad was coming to get us and the um, Twin Towers happened watch that and I'd just done my um, entry course into the Marines. I was joining the military two months later, um, starting training. And uh, I remember watching that and had no idea how much that was going to shape the first sort of decade of my career. Mm, yeah. I had no idea mm -hmm. um, at all. I like, remember watching the planes fly into the, into the Twin Towers and then you know, hour later, my dad comes and picks up and chatting about it, and then off you go. And then next thing, it's like um, start training, and then straight into operations based upon what had happened with the with the twin towers. It was insane. Like it's quite. Uh, I still remember it vividly watching that. You know, the big back TV and those. <laughs> Um, that took up about four four miles of your front room. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, so, yes, yeah, so, and I joined when I was nineteen. I kind of like um, felt like if I didn't, I some I did have some really good people around me when I was a kid, um, but I didn't realise that I did at the time, and I felt like I was quite alone and isolated. Home wasn't like the best place for me, um, and. I kind of ran away to join the military. I used to be in cadets and that was a bit of my saving grace. Although I think I probably would have ended up a little bit wayward, I'm not gonna lie. And then I wouldn't know where I would be now. Um, and I sort of ran away to start training at Limston. And uh, I was kind of happy about that. It was, it was really weird. And like reflecting now, you look at people that do join the Marines, most of them without realizing it are seeking something even if it's not consciously, they don't know. They don't necessarily know what it is right there and then, but they're going to find something. And I felt that, you know, looking back on it, and I've, you know, I've, I've been asked that question that was specifically before. Going back to, um, going back to that time, I think I was looking for 
community. I was looking for um, a routine, like 32 weeks of training is like, the routine's there, the syllabus is there, the hours are there, the days are there, it's written out. And I quite like that structure. I didn't feel like I had a lot of structure in my life and I, and I didn't realize I needed it, but I obviously did because that's why I joined. I needed a you know, purpose bigger than me. Um, it sounds like quite like um, American to say that. Yeah, I just wanted to do my duty and serve my country. And it wasn't necessarily that, but it was just being part of something that was bigger than me um, and being involved in that, like having that purpose. And funny enough, like in my life where I've not had purpose, I've fallen by the wayside. Um, so I know I've always got to be involved in something. It's the all or nothing. Yeah. I, either I'm in or I'm out. Um, but if I'm out, I've got to have something that I'm in with. Otherwise, I just end up going wayward, you know? Um, and the Marines gave me that all in, all gift wrapped. Gave me a wage because I wasn't working. It just gift wrapped everything. Um, also gave a lot of press ups as well. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was a really odd time. And you don't really, you don't really realize it at the time how special a moment and that process is until. You know, I'm staring down retirement. God's sake, I'm, you know, could retire soon. And you don't really realize like what that does to somebody. And certainly for someone like me, how beneficial that was. Mm. I just sort of did it and then moved on. But I look back at it and go, you know, it was a game changer for me. Mm -hmm. Like where, like, you know, like you get train tracks and you can get that, the, the, the switch points. Mm -hmm. Mine wasn't just going like that. It was like like to to go off a, a gentle angle. My, that going through Raw Marines training for me was like a a, a, a a ninety a one eighty. It was like a handbrake turn in my life, you know. And I didn't realize it at the time, so I, I feel really fortunate enough that I made that um, mistake of joining because I was just looking for something. I went, all right, I'll do that because it's just been a it's been a, it was an absolute game changer for me. It really was, and I'm grateful that I did it um yeah without any hesitation i'd do it again because i don't think that if i try to map my life for up to that point and try to do something else i i don't i don't think i would have been the places that i've been that I, I wasn't that person then that i am now mm. that makes sense yeah 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 100 percent and as you said, and, and we've had Johnny Mercer, who was obviously, he wasn't Marine, but I think he was Army Commando potentially, and um, obviously Ben Wadham and, mm. and Mark, and we've had a number of sort of serving serving guys on. And, and as you said, 9-11 uh, changed everything massively. Um, and I think you've done tours in like Northern Ireland, obviously Iraq and Afghanistan. And one thing that Ben talked about um, was that when the lads are kind of over there, they're so young, and they're kind of in the Western world, you're not really built for the death and destruction. And that's why maybe it has such a, a, an impact on the lads out there. How did you find it when you were on tour? So everyone's got their own experience um, on it. Um, I actually felt my coming of age was in Northern Ireland. We did one of the last stop banner tours um, and I flew out. I remember passing out on the front. I mean, don't get me wrong, Afghanistan was like, not not ideal it's like very like what they call kinetic so um a lot of firefights um direct action um where it moved away as we were as we were out there in 2008 some more ieds like that's how they would the tactics changed because they were getting more bang for their buck cheaper uh, more discreet but for me as a person the coming of age was more the island tour where i was 19 i passed out on the friday and then on tuesday i flew out to northern ireland to meet men in the Royal Marines. I thought I was a boy. I, I was a 90, I don't care what anyone says, you know, you, like, it's why it's impressive when you, you look at someone like that, uh, Maino, who played for England the other day at 18. He's a boy. He's a, he's, a, he's a legal man, but he's not a man. He's a boy. And I, I, I went out to Northern Ireland and I, I'm, you know, joined these guys and they'd already been out there a few months and we were in uh, Cross McGlen, um, which bordered the Northern Ireland Island um, border. And we were looking at some pretty big hitters, um, trying, to, trying to follow them and track them and to gain intelligence on them. And we had really big watchtowers with like super powerful cameras on them, like insane cameras. 
um, that you'd look and you track and record movements and whatnot. And I, but Cross McGlenn in the 70s, 80s was not, or certainly 70s, was not a place that British forces needed, but it was like very, very, like very, very, very dangerous place to be. But it still was a bit spicy. And I remember on a, we used to deliberately go out on a Friday and Saturday night at around about quarter to 11, because that's when the pubs were kicking out. And you think that you're tough walking around the streets, like wanting to fight and all the rest of it because you're with your mates. And now you're in someone's backyard and these old, like, life-scarred looking blokes were coming out of the, out of the pubs. And you're 19. And I remember we got, we got trapped down an alleyway once and... Uh, Yeah, it was just it was just an interesting experience. Do you see what I mean? And um, for me, in terms of growing up, to understand the difference to, between where I thought I was as at nineteen, going, "I'm a Royal Marine, I'm I'm a man, I'm good to go." Actually, like there was a massive delta there, and that for me was a realization to say, "Right, you haven't made anything. All right, you've done training. You've okay. You've you've passed out of commando training." but you're still a pup, you're still an idiot, you still have not got the testosterone that these lot have got, you haven't got the experience of this lot, you're still inferior to a lot of people in this world. And it made me um, made me sort of like open to learning from them more. And you know, again, looking back on it, and at the time you don't really sort of think of it like this, but it's like, it's a privilege and honor to be around those individuals in certain operational theaters because they were probably at times equally as scared in Afghanistan, but never showed it. And you learn from that and be around those types of individuals um, to improve you and, and to be better at what you do. And, um, but yeah, it was, that was like my sort of coming of age. Um, but yeah, like Afghan was just different. Mm. It was just different. Mm -hmm. It's like, you, you, turn, you, you, you turn up in this place, we work with Afghan special forces, you know, and they'd been known to Literally in a firefight, switch sides. Fuck off. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Literally in a, in a firefight, they would like just jump. Like we had, there was one 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 patrol where I remember a lad called Matty Silcock, one of his Afghans literally jumped over the wall and joined the the Taliban in that firefight. And it's like, okay. So you know, and we, so we had a bit of a different experience. So there was me, me and Dutchy would be like the um, the the British forces mentors for an Afghan troop. Mm -hmm. So we would have like 20, 25 Afghans that we would take out. So normally when the, in, a, in a normal um, Royal Marine tour, you'd be around 30 Royal Marines or, or what or et al. But we didn't have that. It was me and him with Afghans. So it was really, really fucking difficult and quite like, um, an interesting time to adapt to who you could actually trust and who you could. I was going to say trust must have been horrible. Like, yeah, I mean, it was like, um, so I remember the troop officer. And so the other thing about Afghan was very much well, like we'd learned is that they're very tribal. So they don't work on, or well, certainly when we were there, they didn't work on the best person for the job. They worked on, if your tribe was more senior, that's who was in charge, but they could be shit. And that's what happened. We had a, uh, a, an Afghan officer who was terrible, terrible. And one of the um, seniors was from a lesser tribe, but he was an amazing soldier, really, really good. So I'm like, right, out, troop boss, off you go. But by doing that, I then upset the apple cart within the troop because that was like, brought real shame to this guy. So I quickly then had to move this guy into a headquarters position where he it didn't have any effect at all. It was like planning, but he didn't plan anything. He just made him feel like he had a super... Yeah. And you had to play around with this as well. So you, not, only, not only were you going out with people that you didn't really know at all because a different culture didn't have the same language, you didn't know whether they were going to... whether they were any good or not. You didn't know whether they were going to jump the fence or not. And uh, you, you just didn't know any of this stuff. So we quickly had to build rapport with them and I would do things like when we, we were out on patrol in Ramadan like obviously I'm not um, I'm not my, my, my religion isn't um, Muslim 
but I would get up with them when they prayed in the night and when they when they ate food, um, not because I would pray, but just to respect the fact that they did. Mm. And they like, but the acts of doing stuff like that w was in incredible. Mm. Um, and then you started to then build rapport very, very quickly. I used to go over to their sort of uh, uh, food area when we were on base and eat with them and share food with them. And then I would then, you know, and just little moments where you would cross, you'd dissect through culture and actually realize that they might be dads or they'll have, yeah, they've got families exactly the same as us, although that Western and their culture wasn't the same. As people, they are very much the same. They, they, they've got the same dear, like genetic sort of makeup, bone structure, muscles. You know, they've got a, a, a family culture which they hold different, dear differently to them than we do, but still, they're still part of that. And so you start cutting through and, by the end of it, it was it was a uh, it was it was a bit sad to leave in that respect because I really felt that there was a nucleus of them that were like a family, um, and I really could trust them. Um, I remember one time, so they have um, uh, they used to make rice. It was amazing. We used to get like rations. They'd like cook chips. They take like fresh potatoes in in on ops of them stuff. So no wonder I was going over to eat with them. Anyway. So they would, um, they'd make rice and rice like was a big deal, but it was, a it was beautiful the way they did the rice. So I said, uh, through the interpreter, I said, well, this is out when we was uh, um, harbored up in the middle of the desert. We just done a day action and we moved out. I said, right, I'm gonna make your dinner tomorrow. And they're all laughing now. And there's no way he's gonna be able to make this. And I said, right, tell me how you do it. So it was like a couple of simple steps. I went down and wrote it down my notepad. And then the next day, like I've been revising it. I didn't want to get my notepad out because I wanted to feel like, like and it was, it was fairly simple, but you can get it wrong quickly with rice, right? So I um, cooked this rice and the, the, the guy who was the chef, although he was a soldier, but he was the, the guy that cooked, they used to put um, a, uh, a rifle rod. They used to clean the rifles out in the rice because if it fell over, it, was too, it hadn't been cooked enough. Okay. But if it stayed rock solid, it was cooked too much. So it had to move a little bit. <laughs> and uh, it was like very, uh, very scientific. Anyway, he's put this rifle rod and it moved a little bit. And inside I'm like fist pumping, going, nailed this, nailed this, nailed this. And they loved it. They absolutely loved it. But it was all part of the rapport building process, all part of it. Mm. And, and then you'll, like, and you build respect by understanding. Um, and I've carried that on in the rest of my career, that particular like skill development, trying to build a rapport with people mm -hmm. to be able to do that. And it just cuts through so much, yeah. so many boundaries that you get to the person as opposed to what they want to see. Yeah, I bet. And you've had obviously a, a, such a long career, mate. I mean, it's what, 23 years now, 23rd year? Yeah, yeah um, something like that, yeah. I mean, you know, we could sit here all for days probably talking about your whole career, but are there any other like really key standout moments in that time that, that when you reflect back, like just just are there straight away. Yeah, so I always say that I had two parts to a career. One was very much war fighting. Yeah, um, and then I then by default, you know, uh, at HMS Drake and down here they've got a recovery unit, complex trauma um, Hasler, and I went to work there just as a stocking filler. Just can you go and work there for three months? And I and I was, before I went on to another job, and I was like, yeah, okay, let's do this. In that time, I managed to get a trip to San Diego, as you do. And um, it was to a Wounded Warrior Athlete uh, program. So this is a kind of like where my current journey started, really. And I went there and it was uh, the US Marines had invited the Royal Marines over to take part in a adaptive games, essentially. Um, you've heard of Invictus Games. Mm -hmm. So like that, it was that this was before Invictus Games and, and less of a showpiece than Invictus, there's a lot of us, um, they've done really well with that. But we went over and um, I remember there was a lad called Rosie who was on a patrol uh, that they were handing over to the US Marines. And when you hand over, instead of just sending everyone out and everyone coming back, they will have an advance party that will go out and they will do a ground familiarization and go out for like maybe three or four weeks before the rest of the teams come out, the rest of the men come out, and then they then extract, the Royal Marines would extract out. Then US Marines have got people that have familiarized, familiarized themselves with the ground, so it's not just a start and stop. Yeah. And Rosie was out on a patrol and um, they, they took a knee and basically stepped, they, an, a, an IED was detonated. Um, and the US Marine had only been out there like two weeks, took the brunt of the blast and died. 
and Rosie was left blind in one eye and then on one hand basically had like a thumb and like a uh, didn't really have much the uh, digits were gone and scarring on his face anyway good lads we go out to um, he was out there and it was there for two weeks it was great watching everyone compete and oh, it was all good and the hand cycles and and it wasn't until the end when I said right well, anyone see where Rosie is uh, he's still in his room so we've got to get a taxi to the airport we're going to be late so I went up to his room, knocked on the door. I said, all right, mate, everything all right? He said, yeah, just packing my bag. He said, do you want me to help with anything? He said, no, no, it's all right. He went up to his bag and it was like a big bag with a zip down the middle. And he sat on his bag and squeezed his knees together and then stood, stood to get his bag done up with one hand because he'd loaded it so much that he's buying the kids stuff. He couldn't get the bag done up properly. And in that moment, I went, I get it. It's not the big stuff that's the problem. It's the fact that these lads were feeling useless because they couldn't put a nail in the wall to hang a picture of their kids, that they couldn't play kick, kick a football or they couldn't ride a bike or, you know, the normal stuff. And it was the behind the scenes thing that when, you know, we see, we saw in that sort of period where you had the, the complex trauma injuries were presented and like Mark will tell you this, Mark will tell you this, you know, right at the start is like, Everyone had a lot of, um, everyone couldn't bend over backwards enough for Mark. But Mark's problem wasn't the fact that, you know, of course, he needed to learn to walk again. But it was like people are not understanding the, and not appreciating the time it takes him to get ready. Mm -hmm. So me and you can jump out of bed, quick shower out the door in 20 minutes. Mark can't do that. Like even if he got out of bed to get going, like it takes him a lot longer. And so it was that adaption and allowing that environment for these lads to just be normal. But it wasn't our normal because we couldn't just overlay what we did on them because they just couldn't function that way. Um, you know, fast forward then, you know, went out to Invictus Games, um, did a few of those. And, and that's kind of like, it's kind of like where my, my sort of passion for people came in mm -hmm. because it was the quiet stuff that no one ever saw. You know, when you sat at home and maybe you got the thoughts in your heads of certain things that no, you never tell anyone about, mm -hmm. but it was like understanding that that happens. So how can we help with that? Knowing fine well that they, you wouldn't say that it happens, but it does. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where the sort of like love and passion for helping people came and, you know, the mental health project at work came out, out of that. And, you know, arguably where, why Beachfront is the way it is, because mm -hmm. it's the off the mat stuff that's really important. Yeah. To, to, to support and progress people. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, 100%, mate. And tell us about the uh, the Regain initiative. Yeah, so again, it was like, it was, um, it was, it was supposed to be to help people, but in the end, it ended up destroying me. Okay. And I, and I'll go back to that all or nothing comment, comment again. So, I had a, I've got a mate, Phil Eaglesham. He contracted a disease in Afghanistan called Q fever. And um, he lives in Taunton now and we met him through going to Hasler and we went out to uh, Wooden Warrior Games with him. And we become, we're like brothers now. He's like my best mate, hands down. I've only ever known him in a wheelchair. And when I was talking to him and some of the other patients, it was like, okay, I think we need to do a little bit more than PTSD because there was all sorts of, people that were suffering from ill health and it was not, not really well known then so um in my quest to try and help i then literally dived straight into this thing and i gave everything emotionally intellectually physically time resource you name it i was working hours and hours to get this thing up and running to make things better for people for the unseen stuff that was destroying like my friends like literally destroying them and you know, I've never been someone that if there's a problem, most of the time, if there's a problem, you've got to try and fix it. Don't just sit there and accept the, accept, accept a problem, right? I'm, 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 I'm okay at that. But this was like, okay, there's a problem. We need to do something about this. And over, over the time, over the course of, of developing this thing, you know, I remember at the Royal Marines Conference, I had the, uh, General, General McGowan was there and um, all the senior officers in the Royal Marines uh, were there in the morning of that. Uh, conference I was going to present what we were doing I had a breakdown in the office um, and 
Like I just, I, I remember I just was, I, I started crying and I didn't know why I was crying. Never, never happened before. Anyway, it was like, I remember it because it was uh, the day that we were launching the project after five, four or five years of, of, of working on it to get it to a point. Anyway, um, I went to a Victus game, Sydney, and at the closing ceremony, walked out, felt like I was having a panic attack and I phoned up, a, uh, and I didn't know why, and I phoned up a, um, a guy, Rick Coatsy, who he was, he was at the time the Navy Leaf Psychiatry, become a really good um, mentor and friend of mine. And I phoned him, I can't remember what it was like, what, what, uh, what the time was in the UK, but I was sat on a bench and I was like shaking. And um, I phoned him, I said, uh, Rick, I think I've got a problem. And his reply was, it's about time you realise that. <laughs> and that just stopped me in my tracks. And, uh, anyway, I went back to the UK, I went up to see him, I had quite an emotional meeting, would, like chat with him over coffee. And he said, you're like a drug addict, you're like an addict. He said, because when you, you try to help people because you don't feel like you're enough. And when you, like an addict, will take drugs, the next hit's got to be a bit more and the dosage goes up, the frequency goes up. And then at some point they'll overdose because the body can't take it. And he said, and that's what you've done. You've overdosed in trying to help people. And so what I realized I was doing was plumbing myself into and forcing myself into never saying no to anyone. You could phone me and say, mate, can you help me with this? I'd be like, yeah, I'm there. At the sacrifice of my family, of me, my time, my recovery, my, my sleep, my me, I just gave everything to everyone else. And I emotionally bankrupt myself because I was trying to, you know, it turns out that I never felt like I was ever enough. Um, and like imposter syndrome, even coming here, like I still have to deal with that now, like in the car and people would like, maybe that will, might know me that will listen to this. They'll be thinking, hey, no way, not, oh, like he's a, you know, he's a pretty strong guy. And but even coming here going, I can't believe I'm doing this podcast. Like, it's like a bit weird. And should I be here or not? You know, you know, how it is right. Yeah. Um, and, and again, it kind of like everything that's happened in I don't believe that had I not joined the Marines, I'd ever have found that out. I ever would have been exposed to that. And I probably still would be running and feeling not enough without realizing it, without joining the military. And beachfront wouldn't exist. Regain wouldn't exist. You know, eventually it's helped, but I'm, I'm, I've moved away from it now. I'm glad I did it. One, because it helps people, but two, more importantly, I found a lot out about myself that I didn't know. Um, and I, you know, and then Beachfront comes at the end of that where I love jiu-jitsu, but I know fine well that people have got stuff going on. Whether it's not right now, they will have or they have had. And I just want that to, to help with not just rectifying issues, but helping people to move forward and perform mm -hmm. and just like try and nail life as much as possible. And if someone comes to do anything that I've been involved with, and walks away just feeling a half a percent better, then I'm, that's a win for me. That's a win for me, so. Yeah, man, that's great. And how do you manage that That now? Do you not kind of like lose yourself in things now? What do you do I, different? I, I don't, I don't, that's <laughs> thing. I don't, I don't. I don't, it's this, it's, this, it's this cocktail of knowing that I am a magpie when it comes to thing, things. I'm like, right, let's do this. I'm in, let's get, let's get like, I'm definitely better at saying no to things. Definitely better. Um, not perfect. And I always go back to my default of the 80-20 rule. <laughs> so I probably was 20-80 last time. You know, 20 like eight, um, twenty percent me, 80% everybody else. Probably worse, worse than that. But now I'm definitely like better at saying no, I can't do that. Or recommending um, fit in a time um, where, it's, where it's suitable to do it. Um, but I still have, have moments. I still have like times where I will sit there and just think, what, what am I, why do I, what, it's crazy, but like, what gives you the right to think that you can start your own business? It took me two years to register a business, two years, because I know it was the 15 minute process mm -hmm. on company's house. It's easy to do. I'm like, oh, I just don't know whether I'm going to be good enough here. I don't know if, 
And like we're talking about like uh, Dan Bassett with a grappler soap. And like, you know, I take inspiration from people like that who, and he won't mind me saying this, he's rough around the edges, but he doesn't give a fuck. It's like, I'm just going to do it anyway. And people might view me as that. And that's great if they do, but I need to get that from somewhere myself. And so I, what, how I try and mitigate against that, I try and surround myself with people that I'm going to draw from, not use, but like be enthused and inspired by. Um, and it doesn't have to be someone like David Goggins because I'm, you know, even he will have his dark days, but he still gets it done. It's people that I can connect with and I understand that they are just honest, hardworking, like, come on, we'll do it anyway. And we kind of, like me and Dan, often phone each other up for a little bit of a moan mm -hmm. without realising we're doing it and just tell each other what we're doing yeah. and just give a little bit of advice. Mm -hmm. And I've got a few people like that that I can, I, I do that with. And then, you know, now thinking about it, like that I do do it with, that does help with that. But it doesn't expel it. It doesn't, it doesn't stop it. It's still still like who the fuck do you think you are like thinking that you can make a success of this you know how do you, you really think that you're going to be bigger than BJJ Globetrotters you know on one hand I'm going yeah on the other hand I'm going no you know it's that argument you know everyone has it mine is like quite loud <laughs> um, that, that internal dialogue that happens to the point where I might sit in the front room and I'm there but and the kids are there but I might as well not be there you know that's when it gets bad and jiu-jitsu for me is like more so than rugby ever was is a place where I know that that's always a constant not now because my ankle's trashed but um, it's a constant in my life that I know that I can go and just not escape because I don't want to escape away from the kids but you get the point you just go and it's just like this environment it clears your head, is, it clears your head. Oh, just to, just to, or even just a reprieve from it mm. just a reprieve just an hour and a half or hour where you can just not think about that stuff where when it's bad, it's bad. And you go, I need to go to jiu-jitsu and the people around you are like, come on, let's get, get some rolling done. And they don't realise how much they're helping, mm -hmm. but they really do. Yeah. They really, really do. Yeah, 100%. We, we touched on earlier, obviously, how you can do like deep work through taking rest periods. But I think that applies not just to work, but relationships as well, right? And I think, um, you know, that uh, some of the people that I work with, I was explaining something similar recently where we were talking about self-care and, and looking after yourself. And I always use like the oxygen mask analogy. You know, there's a reason they tell you to put it on first on planes because if you pass out, your kids, your missus, whoever you're trying to help are going to go as well. So you look after yourself first, I think. But yeah, I think it's easy to, to get wrapped up in work. But I think sometimes when you go to jujitsu and you take that self-care and that time, that also makes you a you know sort of a, a better parent and a, and a you know better, better, better partner and everything as well. So yeah, yeah. No, I agree with that one hundred percent. Yeah, it's a massive knock-on effect. I feel like you're probably gonna feel embarrassed talking about this and, and feel like you don't deserve it. But obviously, you got your MBE, um, twenty eighteen, I think. Was that for that work? Yeah, it was. Yeah, um, yeah, fucking hell, yeah. Um, it was. It was for regain. Yeah, and um, you know, I just see myself as someone who's just trying to help. Um, you know, from a from a from a council house in southwest London is like you know, you get this it was actually quite quite funny because I was going on Christmas leave and uh I was going on Christmas leave and um there was like a missed delivery from Raw Mail in the in the in the in the in the door. So I was like, right. If I don't get it, whatever it is now, then I'm not going to be able to get it till the new year because it was like post office was shut and it was like the last safe moment. So I go down there and there was like an envelope um, that had like a Royal Navy stamp on the back of it. And I was like, fuck, what have I done? Because <laughs> I only time I get any official documents <laughs> is like if I've had, you know, I've had a little bit of a sordid career as well. Um, yeah, anyway, so I open it up and there's another envelope inside of it. I was like, the, the, you know, you got your, your crap travel envelope and then this is really nice. And I opened it up, I was walking out the post office and I was like, I opened it up, I was like, um, you know, stamped um, with the Royal Crest on it. And it's like, uh, dear, uh, um, dear Captain Morris, uh, we're pleased to announce. And I was like, I nearly like had to fucking take a knee because I was like, what I was reading, I just couldn't believe it. And like, I got really, I get a bit emotional about it now. And it's like, 
I just couldn't believe it. Like, why, why would I, why would you do that? Why, like, why would I, why would you write that for me? And like, then understanding the scrutiny that takes on the levels of, of um, board, that there's about three boards it takes of different levels of the military for it to get through to go, these are the ones we want for this period. You know, from all the services, and I'm like, why? Why would it be me? Like, why? I, I, I didn't understand. I didn't understand it. I couldn't. I couldn't. And then, like, especially as I trashed myself. Do you sort of mean? Especially, I was like, well. And then I was thinking, did you do that because I trashed myself? Well, no, you wouldn't know that I trashed myself. Like, and it was just this, like, the the this imposter the imposter syndrome again, just on in there going. Is this even real? Like, why would you like? You know, I've never been great at taking compliments, never been great at like taking praise. I've always like enjoyed being the underdog, um, understated, you know, under be understated and over deliver. That's sort of the motto, isn't it? And um, yeah, and, and went to the palace and it was I went with Scoobs, the lad um Phil, the lad who I get Q fever. He went he came up with me and you know, we we all went up, the four of us, and and we went to the palace and it was in, it was an amazing day. It really was. Um, but yeah, it was just, I just didn't, I, yeah, you're right. I, I just didn't understand why me, why, why, why would I, what's like loads of people do great things. It's a huge honor though, mate. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. But like, there's loads of people that do great things that don't ever get recognized for anything. And I'm like, you know, and I, sit, and I don't do it too much now, but that's the kind of thing that I have to, I deal with every day on a daily basis. Like, and then for some days I'll be like, nah, I'm smashing this up today. <laughs> And then I'll be like, oh, I've just said that out loud. Now I've got to do it. Uh, so yeah, but it was yeah, it was it was a special day. Um, it really was a special day, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll um, paid enough for the photos, so I'll um, definitely be uh, looking back <laughs> over those on a regular basis. Yeah, mate, it's yeah, it's amazing, mate. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. It sounds like you've done some amazing work, despite obviously feeling quite humble about it. But I, I feel like this is the case for so many people that do so many amazing things though. I think often it comes from that that place of, you know, maybe not feeling that they're, they're doing enough and they always strive to do more as a result. Um, so I don't think you're probably alone in that feeling. And, um, you know, my boss at work, when I got my current role, it was a bit of a jump from my previous role and I was exactly the same, felt like I had, like, well, I had massive imposter syndrome. And he said to me at the time that, you know, if you ever find yourself in a position where you don't have imposter syndrome, you've probably completed whatever you're doing. You should find something else where you do get imposter syndrome. So I think it's quite normal to kind of challenge yourself and feel that way. Yeah, I really do. Yeah, I, mean, I, I definitely feel it. It's been beneficial for like my, my son. He's he's uh, just turned seven. He he does lack quite a lot of confidence. So I feel like, and again, it's like a bit sort of out there, but I feel like everything that's happened is for me to be able to give that experience to them to go don't worry about it let's just get it done anyway yeah and it almost helps me be better by saying that to them because i now i've got to walk the walk yeah <laughs> even though i don't want to yeah you see what i mean yeah um, so yeah it's, it's everything happens for a reason um and like i go back to had i not joined the join the marines it wouldn't it wouldn't have happened none of it would have happened so i'm like grateful for 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 like I say, making that mistake and walking through the gates yeah. to take that because you never know where it's going to unfold. Yeah, 100%. And then thinking about all that experience, about everything you've been through, everything you've done, like when you think about kind of human performance and, and people being the best that they can be, I mean, what are the key things that you sort of say to people in regard to kind of just elevating themselves to the, the highest possible point? Ironically, <laughs> ironically, it's never going to be perfect. Um, and this is the, again the conversation I had with Dan yesterday literally even just like, like the, last night um, it's never going to be perfect and sometimes you just got to do it just do it anyway um, and I've had to walk the walk with that myself um, understanding how what affects you um, like being present enough to under, understand how you are feeling or thinking at that moment and going I just need five Um I probably need a little bit more sleep. I need a little bit more water. I need, you know, from a from a sort of um, control, control the controllables measure. Um, but also, more importantly, and I think above ever, above all else, is you've got to surround yourself with people that will elevate you. You have to, and that doesn't mean to say that you get rid of all your mates that won't, because you're, you know, yeah. 
you, you don't do that, but you have to surround yourself um, with people that are that are that are pushing as well, that are in that are in the same boat. That you 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 take solace from going. Actually, we're making the right decision. Um, we don't know whether, like you said before about this, you, you don't know whether we've pushed this too hard or not, but we're in now. We've just got to get on with it now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like in five years time when everyone goes, oh, your podcast is amazing. You go, yeah, but you didn't know what it was like the first couple of months and we were arguing about what cameras to buy. You know, But I think if you do that on your own, it's really difficult. And you, I think you have to surround yourself with people that are going to elevate you without question of a doubt. Surround yourself with good people. Everyone says it and good things will happen surround yourself with amazing things and amazing things will happen so um, but you actively got to seek that it won't just fall on your lap you've got to seek that it might be that if you, you, it won't happen because you're, bit, you're a bit of a dick well don't be a dick and change the way you are it might be that you're not putting yourself out there much it might be that you're not giving enough and also feel that you, you've got to give to receive not, not give you've got to give and you will receive not give to receive um, because people see through that if you genuinely give at some point karma will come back round and someone will do something for you at the right time when it's supposed to happen you're like I can't believe that and the amount of times that's happened with me I'm like why have you done that I'm like yeah but do you not remember three years ago when you I was like no you know and then they're waiting to pay pay that back yeah. without realising it you mm -hmm. know um, but you've actively got to go out and do that and make it happen and, and understand that it's not going to happen the instant gratification is not going to happen. This is hard yards, hard, hard yards. Um, and it's almost necessary, I think, for, for you to appreciate it. Um, the same as what you're finding out with, with your development of this podcast, which is great, you know. Um, eventually, you'll look back and go, that's amazing. But if it was easy, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't look back and go, it's amazing. Because then mm. everyone would do it as well. Yeah. Yeah, awesome, mate. Thank you. And just remind us again about Beachfront BJJ and when the next event is. Yeah, so um, next event is on the 15th, 16th of June um, in Exmouth. Um, day tickets, weekend tickets available. Um, we've got an amazing lineup of, of people come down, coming down. The venue's incredible. It's a riverboat cruise on the Saturday night as well um, with traditional fish and chips or dietary equivalent. Um, and I've got some online seminars that are coming up as well. Um, so yeah so uh, the Instagram has all the information and the website so yeah I'm really looking forward to it yeah awesome mate sounds amazing Mel I've really enjoyed that chat mate thanks for having no, me no, thanks boys Thank I you, appreciate mate. it and I appreciate your time and uh, thanks for having me on cheers, cheers mate. mate thank cheers, you buddy.